So welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name's Andrew, and you're watching the Kelly's Country Life. If this is your first time visiting the channel, thanks so much for stopping by. Consider subscribing because we post weekly videos. So I'm gonna go ahead and apologize for all the fans that's gonna be running in today as I'm talking, but this microphone does a pretty good job of blocking them. It is August, it is miserable hot down here in Florida. I've gotta keep the air rolling over me. So we're back on part three of the outdoor kitchen build. I had to take a little break, a lot of stuff going on in life. We're gonna knock out a couple days worth of work and I'm gonna get you out of video. So in today's video, we need to go ahead and start preparing the electrical in here. Depending on if UPS shows up or not, we may go ahead and get into the propane plumbing in this episode. We wanna go ahead and get the tops uh, skimmed over with all of our plywood. We're preparing it for tile countertops. And let's see here, we have some fireproofing material that I think should show up today. Lots of little oddball things going on in this episode right here. Also, before we get started, a huge thanks to a company called Vivor. They sponsored this build and have provided all of the stainless steel doors and drawer sets for this. So it's really helping beef up the DIY build. Don't worry, we're gonna include the cost of those donated goods at the end of this so you can get a total cost idea um, you know, on, on what it would cost you to build something like this. We're trying to keep it budget friendly and not spend 15, 20 grand here, you know, a few thousand dollars, get us a nice outdoor entertaining cooking space. And I think we can knock it out, but a big thanks to them for doing that. It really spices up the look of this without a whole lot of money. They've also provided discount codes. So look down in the description. If you're interested in any stainless steel outdoor kitchen, barbecue grill set, uh, type of door and drawer sets, they did provide a pretty de decent discount here for quite a while. So again, big thanks to them. All right, so electrical. I had to go buy some very odd boxes that screw in. I couldn't use your standard nail-in ones because they're designed for half-inch sheetrock on a wall. Well, I'm gonna be mounting these electrical boxes to post in here, but then we have three-quarter inch plywood. Then we're gonna have half-inch tile backer board on that. Then you have thin set, three-eighths inch tile. Oh my goodness, you can see how thick this gets before long off of that post and your standard boxes aren't gonna work. Luckily, I found some with some mounting holes way in the rear to allow me to space these way out from this post. So I'm gonna get me a rough spacing, inset a little from the tile is perfectly fine and acceptable. So we're just gonna get a rough spacing here to clear that tile board and our three quarter inch plywood and we're gonna go to town. Keep in mind, we got a black stone right here so I don't want any outlets behind that. They would just melt, that wouldn't be safe. Big old cooktop right here. So we're probably gonna put one outlet in down here, one over here, and then a couple in this area back here to where we may wanna plug in crock pots and Insta pots and things like that in the future if we're entertaining. Pretty much these couple outlets right here is gonna be if guests wanna plug in a cell phone. And I'm also running this off of a 20 amp circuit feeding just the bar top because we may wind up getting us one of those, uh, you know, like pit bosses or Traegers, one of those plug in the wall smokers basically. And it would be nice to have a 20 amp circuit right here and be able to run that, that big smoker right there as well. So we gotta have lots of future add-ons and plans for this. So as I mount these boxes too, I also have to think for add-ons for other items like this electric cooktop. Well, it has an igniter and it requires a power source as well. So I'm actually gonna have to run a wire from it over into this box before I daisy chain off to another one to provide that power that's needed to our cooktop. So a lot of our everyday viewers that watch this entire house build are gonna laugh at this one. They know that I overwired well, I won't say overwired, but wired the heck out of this house for any future add-ons. And out here on the porch was one of those areas that I kind of went a little crazy, making for sure that we had plenty of power and could handle any future add-ons. And what I mean is not only is there a 20 amp circuit that I ran out the wall down here, it's on its own independent breaker, 12 gauge wiring, full 20 amps of service. That's what I'm gonna wire the bar up with in all these outlets. But over here, I have a double gain box with two side-by-side -side 20 amp plugs with two more independent 20 amp circuits. One feeds down the rest of the porch so we can run big heavy duty fans. 
but essentially I have three 20 amp circuits feeding this area right here, which sounds like overkill and for everyday use it will be, but we plan on maybe hosting some Thanksgivings over here, some get togethers, things like that. And it would be nice whenever guests arrive with maybe again, crock pots, Insta pots, things like that. It's what we see at cookouts all the time for them to be able to plug into multiple outlets, not trip anything. And for example, if I need to run fans because it's the heat of summer, plus run, say a Traeger, you know, some sort of uh, electric smoker, we don't want any issues. We actually have four independent circuits feeding this porch with 80 amps of total capacity or service should we ever need to max that out. All right, so you can see I've made a lot of progress. I had to jump in and out with that lightning storm that just went by. So I just got to working and didn't do as much recording. So what I did is I ripped down a three quarter inch plywood bar top right here. And the majority of this is over wood, but then I have a bunch of decorative uh, supports that I'm gonna put underneath. So I had to leave just enough room for that. And we're gonna support this really well. Don't forget we're also putting the uh, tile board backer on top of this but it's already extremely sturdy. Far more stable than I was realizing. Three quarter inch plywood. It's some really strong stuff. I'm impressed. Uh, so I'm not too terribly concerned, especially once I get a bunch of these countertop supports run down. I, I don't think there's gonna be an issue personally. So I did wanna say we left a very large overhang on this bar top 
and a very short overhang over here and that was for a couple of reasons the bar top over here we did not want sticking out on the side porch where you enter the house we just didn't think it would look right we wanted it flush with the house so you can see we have more overhang here not a problem at all the other reason i didn't want much overhang right here don't forget all of our cooking appliances heat rolling up i left just enough of a small gap right here half inch literally to put some under counter strip lighting but we did not want this overhanging and catching heat off of the black stone or the cooktop itself. Plus, we wanted plenty of room for pots and pans. So keep that in mind if you build a bar top. Watch your overhang because, well, all that heat rolling off the black stone over and over and over, although the majority of this is getting tiled and covered up, it could potentially char the wood or give you some issues. As y'all can see, it is early next morning. I want to get on out here so we can start getting some coats of paint on certain areas and it's not just any paint so i have a friend that has a youtube channel henderson's how to and review and he actually custom builds homes over in a beach area of florida and he's seen what i was doing here and he said i recommend that you put some you know flame blocking or flame retardant paint down in the areas where the blackstone's going to go now keep in mind, we're about to layer tile board and concrete board right over this. So we're gonna make it relatively fireproof by doing that. But should any of the heat get up on this tiny lip, which I think is gonna be completely covered or just overheat the tile, the tile board, the mortar to the point that it could potentially start charring the wood, I wanna put a flame protective layer on anything around our heating surfaces. So I could not get fire retardant paint locally and I couldn't get it online in any sort of a quick manner. So what I did is I just bought some regular latex flat black paint, but latex is the key here. Don't get oil based stuff. And I was able to get the additive. So this is made by Flame Check. It's called a fire retardant paint additive Flame Check M11 or 111PA. So this is essentially what was in the latex paint that I was going to buy online. And this eight ounces right here supposedly would treat an entire gallon. I just got, well, a little quart here, so we're not even going to add the whole thing to it. And if you read on the back of it, it claims that on a non-flammable surface, so if you were to put this over metal, tile, whatever, you painted something that just won't burn, it says it will not even smoke and will not flame up. And then it says if you put over a flammable surface like wood or a porous surface, um, to just make sure that you add multiple coats, which I'm going to do. So supposedly this stuff will not allow flame up and on certain surfaces won't even allow smoke. That's odd. We're going to test that today too. I don't just put stuff down and go with it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, I got a couple paint sticks. We're going to dip and test how the paint burns after it dries in a little while on this one. And then after I mix up the paint with the additive, we'll put it on another one right here and see if there is any difference. Now this is a step I probably don't even need to take with all the cement board and tile that's going down, but it wasn't much money. Um, it was recommended, so why not, right? I like to overdo things and make myself sleep a little better at night. So I think I'm gonna pour in half of a quart here. I'll save the rest of this for something else. I have a feeling once you mix this uh, flame check into it, you probably need to go ahead and use up all your paint very quickly. So to technically even for a quart, and I'm only half a quart, I'm supposed to add about two ounces of this stuff. I may go ahead and add two ounces to this. I'm not worried about it changing the consistency of the paint, maybe making it curdle or give me some sort of issues because we're putting tile board right over this anyways. But if you're gonna paint an area where the paint's gonna be visible, but you still want this in it, I'd follow the instructions. I'm gonna mix this up really, really, really well. Make a mark on this piece of wood. We'll coat this in non-treated paint. Let these dry, try to burn them in a little while. Okay, so I've got that mixed really well. I'm just gonna pour some out. Start painting. So 
So these paint stirring sticks are now dry. They've only got one coat, so keep that in mind. And I'll mark this one right here. This has just regular paint, no additive to it. Okay, so we'll start with a regular old lighter here. I'm already seeing smoke. Definitely black smoke rolling off. I don't know if y'all can see that. All right, white smoke. Looks like the wood is getting ready to catch fire. There it goes, on fire. This is the treated paint. Sure hope I see a difference here. So I'm not seeing smoke. Oh, there's some white smoke, but I didn't see that black smoke. The paint is bubbling, but it's refusing to light. Check that out. Bubbling up, but refusing to light. I'd imagine once it completely bubbles off, this may light, but it won't light. Huh. All right, so let's use a torch. This probably isn't a fair comparison. In my situation, wood is gonna slowly heat up and may eventually char, which I don't think is gonna char my situation, but I'm saying if you put a, something around a grill, it just hasn't, doesn't have direct flame, just gets really dried out and heats up. So this is non-treated, and this is a torch. This shouldn't take long at all. All right, whole thing's already catching on fire. Paint's gone. Look at there. Now, with that said, a torch, a couple thousand degrees, this paint may not have a chance against it. Here's the treated paint. Oh, look at here. It's definitely taking a heck of a lot longer. Paint is bubbling. Okay, up there where it bubbled away, tried to catch on fire, and then it goes out. This is definitely, I can tell a difference. Without a doubt, I can tell a difference. And there's no smoke at first either. Yeah, now I've pretty much torched the paint. Now that's an extreme case. Again, nobody's gonna have a torch around all this stuff. I can definitely see the difference, and that's with one very thin coat. I'm dry over there now. I'm about to go put another second thick coat on. So this is just a little extra protection, a little extra peace of mind. All right, next I'm gonna take some of this wood filler putty right here, and I'm gonna go around and fill in all of the nail holes, and there's a bunch of them, anywhere I know I'm not gonna add trim. All the corners and some of these edges, not worried about those nail holes, we're gonna trim that out with some white trim later to kind of match the rest of the house. Now this wood putty dries kind of quickly, so you wanna work quickly with that, but all I'm gonna do is lightly mound over the nail hole. I've done one around with a hammer, make sure all my nails are beat in, there's a little bit of a cavity, then I'm gonna mound over it. And the reason you leave it mounded out is because as it dries, it shrinks, but I always wanna keep a mound on it so I can come back on my orbital sander and sand it off. I do not want to leave any sort of an indenture.
All right, so now it is time for me to go ahead and start covering this entire kitchen and bar top with tile backerboard, cement backerboard. So before I do that, I want to take any flex and any uh, odd angles out of this bar top, especially. So I'm just going to go ahead and pop a couple of brackets in real quick, and I'm going to put them where I know I'm going to trim and the holes themselves don't matter. And that's because there is a little bow and flex in this plywood. So I want to get this where I want it. So whenever I screw in the tile board, there's some rigidity to it in the proper orientation. I really don't want to screw to it now and it be way out and then I have to really try to fight with it later to kind of get everything lifted up. So just popping a few of these in real quick should get everything nice and level. Now when I say level, I'm actually going to tilt this bar top slightly to the outside. So if water gets on it, it tends to want to run off to the ground not to the inside and I'm just going to barely and I mean barely tilt it this direction because the last thing you want is an uneven bar top with glass drinks or plates or anything else on it but just the slightest out of level on the bubble not going to hurt to go this direction and I forgot to mention throughout this entire build my entire kitchen top I have slightly sloped back this direction everything sloped in that may fight me a little when it comes time to lay tile and get everything level we'll see but for the same reason i didn't want water to run to the rear when it blows in here i want it to run that direction off toward the floor so i do have a little bit more pronounced uh, out of level on the inside but the bar top uh, just slightly out of level is all that i need to do so this is my worst end right here everything else is is really good I need to lift this up just a little. It's too much down in this direction. So let's go ahead and do that. And obviously we'll remove these whenever it comes time to paint. I just don't know how stiff this tile board is going to be and how much it's going to hold it in the shape. And I want it holding it in the right shape before I remove these shelf supports here. So I'm going to try something new today. This is tile backer board here. This is called Durock. Um, very commonly used. Of course, a lot of people are moving to Schluter products and a little bit better looking products out there now. If I was doing floor tile and a major bathroom, I probably would have coughed up money for that stuff, but this is almost overkill for this situation. I have just always heard it's better to tile over some sort of cement backer board than plywood, but I'm already happy with how strong the setup is over there. This is just gonna allow me to get better adhesion and apply a waterproof coating and backer to this. So typically you would cut this stuff with a diamond cutoff blade on your uh, angle grinder, which makes a heck of a mess. I have a fiber cement blade that would probably cut this for my circular saw. It's what I cut all my fiber cement board on the house with. I've got a jigsaw blade that's made for that stuff, or I've actually heard that you can score this stuff and snap it. We're gonna try it on one piece in case I damage it because I did buy one extra piece. So there's actually like a fiberglass webbing holding this together just underneath the surface. You see it sticking out the end. I have heard all that you have to do is just score down through this stuff into that, basically cutting that webbing, and this should snap like drywall. I'd imagine what I need to do is snap this and then cut the other side, kind of like you do drywall. Let's see here. Put that very edge right here. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. That's really easy. All right. I see people cut this stuff all the time. Now I'm wondering why at least for straight cuts. Now look at that. That's what I'm talking about. Here's another point to bring up. Whenever you screw into cement backer board, cement itself can be mildly acidic or corrosive uh, to fasteners. Purchase fasteners that's actually designed to go through cement board. And I purchased ones just long enough to go through sit flush and fully bury into this wood. I didn't really want it popping out the other side for fear of anybody reaching underneath and touching it, but we can always grind that down if it does happen. Everywhere else over here, not gonna matter at all. But make sure you get a proper fastener that's designed to go through cement board. That is critical. Perfect. 
perfect length screws. They're not sticking through. You can feel the wood bulging, but it's not gonna actually stick any gas sitting here. So as y'all can see behind me, I've got a lightning storm on the way. I can already hear the thunder. Radar doesn't look good. So it's time for me to quickly get tools up and get ready to get them off the porch because this job has been shut down. I don't know how many different times with lightning storms. So we had a severe thunderstorm so bad last night, blew water all the way up underneath the porch, snapped limbs out of the trees. Talking like probably 40, 50 mile an hour wind gust. A little scary. It's happened a lot. All right, so in order to go ahead and get y'all a video out, I think I'm gonna cut this off right here. I'm just gonna continue to do what you already see me doing. Everywhere there's black, I'm just gonna keep scabbing in pieces of this concrete board, and then we'll start the next episode with me seam taping and mudding all the corners, all the joints themselves to get everything ready for that waterproofing membrane. Now, I've had a lot of people ask, hey, where's the videos here lately? So I wanna let y'all know, while I'm working on a project this big, I'm probably realistically only gonna be getting about three videos out a week. One or two is gonna be stuff around the property and one video a week with a project this big. I have other priorities, other things that go on, so I can only usually work two to three days a week on this, and that's about how many days I work before I release y'all another video. So if you add all that up, it's it's just about impossible for me to get out more than three videos a week right now. Typically, I try to shoot for five or so. Uh, just not gonna happen while we got a big project going on. So everything's good, work's going on. There's just a lot of behind the scenes stuff that's not worth recording, chores, errands, things like that. And I do wanna keep making these series videos on building this because I've had a lot of people reach out and thank me for getting into the nuts and bolts of things, for spending more time making several parts to this and showing the the whys, the hows, you know, why am I doing this? This is tools I use, there's a technique. Because if you look on the internet, there's so many people that do a build like this and they'll literally scrunch up two to three weeks worth of work into a 10 minute video, it's all in fast forward and you kind of don't get any explanations why. So this is more for the people that want to know the nuts and bolts, the hows, the whys, uh, so they can learn to build one. Now what I think I'm going to do at the end of this series right here is probably take a lot of every video, put it in one 10 or 15 minute video for the people that just want a down and dirty quick version. But uh, hey, I love sharing tips and tricks. I'm learning myself. By the way, I haven't mentioned to y'all, I'm no professional. I'm just a homeowner trying to save some money and build this himself. So I'll take all the tips and tricks and advice that I can get from y'all as well. All right, so we'll catch you on the next episode where we're going to finish up all of the uh, Dura Rock. Like I said, waterproof everything then, and then we move on to painting and tile. Uh, we'll start wrapping up then. And I just had parts showing up to do all my propane plumbing as well. So. Still a lot left to do, but we've got a lot already here to kind of knock it out. So we're getting there. Thanks for watching.